Welcome to the Startup Grind. The city's leaders in entrepreneurship and thought leaders in the space of startups. And um, so we have the privilege of hearing from Tim Barton tonight. Tim founded Freight Quote in 1998 and has since grown it to a company that um, passed five, over $500 million in 2012. Uh, freight Quote is uh, the largest online freight broker serving freight shipping customers' needs across North America. Tim has been recognized by the local and U.S. entrepreneurial community uh, with several honors, including Entrepreneur Magazine's Top 5 in their Hot 100 ranking, Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year, Forbes Best of the Web for Freight Quote, and Ingram's uh, Kansas City's Best Places to Work For, as well as Kansas City's 100 Fastest Growing Companies. So, and Tim also serves as Chairman of the Board for the Center for Education Reform in Washington, D.C., and is on the Advisory Board for the University of Kansas School of Business. So if you wouldn't mind, please help me welcome Tim Barton. <laughs> So I'm going to try to keep the um, Q&A stuff focused on startups and things like that. And if, if I start veering into big corporate speak and things like that, just like wave your hand or something. Because I can do that. Yeah. For, again, Tim, thank you for coming. First off, just tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and just uh, your, your journey. You know, talk to us. You know, introduce yourself. That way we can know a little bit about you um, personally, you know, whether it's family or, or where you grew up and just kind of your background. Oh, uh, so I grew up in suburban Chicago. Uh, it sounds like a big city, but it really is just like Johnson County, I guess. Uh, and uh, I went to KU. I didn't know anybody there when I went there, but uh, it was a big school figured out as I went. Uh, it was, I got out in, uh, I guess, 88, it was a bad economy, so I went straight into grad school, and uh, I got a master's in finance. Um, but I really, I knew in college I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, they didn't use that term back then. Maybe the French didn't invent it yet or something. <laughs> uh, but, like, literally, they just, like, I would say to people, well, I'm going to start a company. And, and that was, like, sinister, you know? It's like, can't start a company, you know. Like, they didn't talk about that. Like in, in business school, it was all about learn accounting and manufacturing and go get a job at either a you know, big, big eight accounting firm or whatever. But you didn't talk about starting a business. That was not, not in like company. Was that a, a cultural thing or just the way? Uh, I'm probably the oldest guy around here, so who, I can't anybody validate this, but nobody talked about startups back then. So. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know why I said I wanted to start a business, but I did literally tell people, look, I don't know if you can. I said, like, I don't know if you got to ask the government, what you got to do to start a business. Because, you know, in, in school they taught you, okay, corporations have a charter. So I'm like, okay, well, where do you file this charter? <laughs> Who approves it? You know, so, uh, so anyway, when I was in grad school, I had a, a, a friend from KU who was working at AT&T, and he, he said he wanted to leave there and, and monkey around with this uh, this kind of program they wanted to start. And I was like, this guy is a good friend. He's an idiot. And I was like, yeah, I'll just help you out, you know. And um, so it ended up being like five college buddies uh, starting that business. Uh, something people would appreciate was bootstrap. So uh, we were just dead broke, uh, generally living communally, uh, rice and beans. And um, we had this guy. We ended up. Uh, even though he was a college friend, we had to like kick him out of the business. He was he was pretty uh, didn't have the best scruples. So uh, he would go to Walmart, buy like 10 PCs, and every 29 days go return them and get 10 new ones. So we had no money for computers. We're like, where do you get these computers? You know. Anyway, the guy was uh, a little slack, so <laughs> he didn't stick around for. Uh, but anyway, so, so don't stay in contact with him much. Either. I don't. <laughs> uh, so, um, so th that was a, a telecom business. We started it in '91, uh, and um, the government re-regulated uh, telecommunications in 1996, when most of you guys were born. Uh, <laughs> uh, with a uh, act they happened to call the Deregulation Act of 1996. 
uh, that was really the re-regulation act and put all the, the telecom uh, companies like ours out of business uh, eventually. So Sprint used to be in that business, they got out of that business. Uh, AT&T used to be in that business and went out of business and became the Bell South, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, we sold that business in 98 before the, the implosion, which came around 2000. So I had capital from, from uh, you know, successfully selling the business. Uh, and I sat down and just like stared at the you know moon and figured out okay we might start uh, in in telecom you knew or I knew uh, you know data networks and uh, and I know everyone knows the internet is like everywhere and it's so easy but um, but in '98 the internet really wasn't everywhere um, and people didn't use it people didn't have email it was kind of stupid to start an internet company probably but. Um, but it was from the mindset of a data network, like, okay, what industry has uh, a need for a data network that they don't even realize they already have? So, uh, so uh, I picked freight, and uh, and in '98, well, we launched in '99. It was this is the first company to put freight online, and it was very uh, new and disruptive. Nobody was uh, <coughs> people like to get quotes for freight because they had no idea what it costs, and. Um, it was cool, they could just go on and it looked like Expedia, probably even before Expedia was out. It was like, here's all the carriers, the pricing connects to the carriers. It was, it was pretty good stuff. And um, we had a lot of success, we had a lot of fast growth and uh, had uh, fun funding from, uh, I, I funded it for about a year and then got funding from uh, two, two Sand Hill Road uh, VCs and, um, and it was uh, all good. So, so going from uh, telecommunications to freight, that's, that's a fairly, I mean, obviously shifting industries. Um, did you always have an interest in those two industries or did you just see a need? And I don't know anything about freight. Uh, so um, the, the idea was the data network and then, okay, uh, what businesses would want that data network? Mm -hmm. So uh, I looked around at like telecom and some other things and I was like, well, let's, I'll go with freight. Uh, I didn't know anything, I heard about it. I heard, it was, I thought it was big. I thought it was maybe like a $50 billion industry. I didn't do any research. It's like a $350 billion domestic uh, industry. So uh, it's big, uh, it's very fragmented. There's uh, something like 300,000 uh, trucking companies in the US uh, and then millions of uh, commercial shippers. So uh, still is to this day, it's still very fragmented. Tell, tell everyone here a little bit about um, the, the, act, the business model of Freightboat. Um, I, I've talked to several people and then they've heard of the company, um, but maybe not necessarily know exactly like what the business model is and how you would describe that to potential customers. So the core core model is uh, is a broker, so we're buying and selling. Uh, we depict it as you know you get all these choices, but we're making money on all of them. So um, kind of like a catalog of options, and we make uh, we make the money partly because the the providers are really crappy at providing customer service. So if, if the model is just, you know, here's a directory and you can go do it, then it's not going to do much. Uh, we, we've got we've got a thousand people in Kansas City, 1,200 total. Um, so many people just dealing with the, the crap that happens. Like stuff breaks, and stuff doesn't show up, and stuff doesn't get picked up, and all this stuff. And with all the technology in the world, you still can't get bad companies to provide good service. So. And if you think about it, it's like, okay, uh, if no offense to you guys in freight, uh, but like, if you don't do really well in school, you might end up in freight. So. <laughs> <laughs> so watch. Um, if you could use kind of a, a peak and valley or an ebb and flow graph to describe just the freight boat story, what would you say were the biggest milestones that freight boat has hit over the last 14 or 15 years? And what would you say were the, you know, the ONG moments of are we really going to make it? Are we really going to keep going, moving forward as a company? Yeah. So uh, most of you guys probably read about the internet bubble from what is that, 2000? So, uh, <laughs> but uh, read it in books, history books. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, boy, uh, there was so much money going after startups. Like they figured everyone can be an entrepreneur. Everyone can have an internet company because if I give you money, you. Uh, so there's a lot of, of dumb money chasing good to dumb ideas, and um, and you know our business was was already going when we got funded, but but now you had all this money, and the, and the mandate was you know, really big, really fast. So very uh, insistent upon just hire 
ton of people, lose a ton of money, and if you need more money, don't worry about it. Uh, unless the bubble bursts and then all of a sudden you need more money. And it's like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you should have listened to that. Um, but, you know, we got more money when we needed it, and we did okay with that, uh, that raise. And, um, and we got to being profitable about uh, 2003. So, um, Was that a tough decision to go from a smaller company to where, you know, you got that influx of money, and it was like, oh, it's time to get real big real fast. Talk to us about that decision. And yeah, so since it was my second company, and I built a lot of internal systems previously, so, like, uh, when I set up Freyquote and, and kind of mapped it out, it was like, know, one little tiny part was, okay, internet, website. And then everything else was uh, effectively CRM and customer service system, <coughs> leads for sales guys and sales CRM, uh, collections, billing, uh, you know, disputes, all this, you know, uh, infrastructure <coughs> that a lot of people maybe not, don't think about, because they're like, uh, I think a lot of lean startups don't even have to bother with that, which is really cool. Um, but, you know, we had to do credit checks and credit card processing and just everything. So uh, so it wasn't built as a, hey, let's just see if this thing works and then we'll add incrementally. It was built from the beginning as a, like a fully formed enterprise and, and we can hope that, okay, hopefully it works. You know? and, and during that time, you went, you had made two successful acquisitions at that time. Was that part of that strategy of getting really big, really fast? No, that was uh, re reactive to, um, we were doing a, a, a form of, of trucking called less than truckload, which would be like yellow freight here in town. Um, truckload, which is the much bigger market, is far more fragmented, and we sucked at it. And so um, our guys kept hacking at it and sucking worse. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, we went out to buy uh, a truckload brokerage so we could like kind of bring it back to our cave and figure out what they do. Um, and we ended up buying two companies that way. And um, you know, I think it helped. What were the main growing pains of going from small company to big company? Yeah, so finally something I can share with people that they can use. So uh, <laughs> we've got the original stuff out of the way. So, uh, so you know, like everybody's got, uh, when they start getting somewhere, they got to start adding people usually. I mean, I, I'm, I'm mentoring a, a company in town, and I've been mentoring them, do not hire any people and do not get any funding. Just just hide on the ground. But, but eventually you might do that. You might get funded, you might get people. Um, but, you know, people are the biggest, uh, you know, risk in a business because when it's just a couple of founders and you're doing what you're doing, um, it's fairly contained and you know each other and things like that. You start adding more and more people. And, um, I mean, geez, everyone's got their, like, territorialness and it's like, hey, he's doing my stuff now and that was my stuff yesterday and now they're doing it. And that gets really... Now all of a sudden you want to run a business and you're running like daycare. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then you want to hire like smart people. So now they've got their egos with it and everything else. So, I mean, you guys that have, uh, you know, employees, I'm not dissing on employees. I'm just saying that it geometrically, ex you know, increases the complexity of, okay, business is challenging, competitive, everything else. That's even without the people. Now you add in people. And so it's going from trying to establish a good, hey, we have this awesome culture to now we have this we have this culture of policy behind it. And yeah. that's a difficult shift. And well, so I was always uh, very quick to fire people, uh, which is something I'm apparently proud of, I guess. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if they sucked, they sucked. And it's like, look, I could, now I, now I know how to use HR policies <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, warnings. <laughs> but, you know, back when you had 50 people, if a guy is like an a hole, you just like, he's gone the minute you finally figure that out. You're the, I'm the last guy to figure it out, too. But, or at least by the time I figured out, people were like, what took you so long? I thought you guys thought you liked them. So, you know. Either way, I mean, you got to get rid of bad people because that ruins the culture. The good people say, well, shit, if he's here, I'm not staying. So, mm -hmm. uh, so they start deselecting. So, uh, so people is a really key thing. When you start adding people, uh, it, it can either ruin your culture or it can build your culture. But that's that's where things start getting less business focused and more you know, psychology focused and things like that. Sociology. How do you? It's obvious that you're passionate about startups and just entrepreneurship in general. How do you foster that 
at a company that is you know has twelve hundred employees are there certain initiatives or you know maybe programs or what not that you try to get people to think entrepreneurially yeah I mean it's a bit like herding cats a lot but uh, I'd say our culture has people that um, at the baseline are very used to very big change all the time so if you can call that entrepreneurial maybe you can get away with it um, it's at least very change friendly mm -hmm. um, so, so we change a lot. Like so we had, um, we had something like 460 people move desks one Friday. Uh, not just because it was fun to jack with people. It's like <laughs> they said to move because of some realignment stuff. But it's like they didn't blink. It's like, yep, that's what I do sometimes. So, um, so our guys are very used to change. That's the baseline. The people who aren't like that, they should work at the post office or Sprint or something like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't want things to change. So, uh, but, so you could say, oh, okay, they're entrepreneurial. At the very least, they're easy going. They, they can work the flow. Uh, other than that, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, we introduce a lot of new stuff and a lot of new systems and a lot of new, um, you know, just ways of doing things, processes, and um, and sometimes really big changes to products. And um, and because everyone is, you know, at a baseline open to change, they actually like it. They don't tell me but right. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. obviously, especially in the tech space, there's been a lot of uh, co companies, you know, going going public, going from private to public. You have Facebook and, and Groupon and just uh, Obviously, you're at that size now. Is that something that factors into your strategic vision for the future? Is that something you and, and your board or your, your uh, management team talk about? Um, is that something that factors into the next five, ten years? Um, great question, Daniel. Not very helpful for these guys, but I'll answer it. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, we're big enough when you go public. you, you got to have uh, more material earnings than we have to... Uh, Get noticed. So uh, my telecom company is actually public, and if you're public and you're not big enough, nobody notices you, and then your stock doesn't trade, and it sucks. So, um, so you have to be like uh, more than a billion dollar market cap. I mean, not that anybody that is involved in startups really cares about this, but like a small cap company on Wall Street is a billion plus. That's small. So, uh, so. Um, switching now more to just about the shipping industry in, in general. How, as being a tech or online company within that industry, um, would, one, would you consider your guy, you guys disruptive, and how um, how are you guys moving forward to where you're going to continue to be disruptive, especially as competition might start, obviously, being more an online brokerage as well? Yeah, so we've got com competitors, we, and I tell our guys internally, you know, we were disruptive like 12, 13 years ago. That's cool. Uh, now we're not. The, the core business is not disruptive at all anymore. We're just kind of, you know, running on uh, coasting, if you will, mm -hmm. or something. So, so we've got some businesses within the business. That's what I, I spend a lot of my time on, startups within the business that are intentionally disruptive. Uh, one in particular, if you guys know, is uh, in, intended to completely disrupt a business like Freyquote. And um, the idea of that, it's uh, modeled off of Clay Christensen's uh, um, various books, and I can't remember which books. Uh, uh, well, anyway, he coined the term disruptive innovation. So basically, the idea is uh, if you can put yourself out of business, you should do it because if you don't do it, then uh, somebody else could. And if, if you fail at putting yourself out of business, okay, good. Then maybe it's not easy to put you out of business. And, um, so far, we've failed to put ourselves out of business, but I'm still striving to succeed in putting us out of business. <laughs> But if you put yourself out of business, obviously you did it because then you're in business. So. Right. Right. And it's the books are like uh, innovators to learn and their solution. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about uh, the, the economy uh, nowadays, both locally, nationally, globally. Uh, and typically, the freight industry is a key indicator of economic growth. You know, as consumers start buying more, stores start wanting to stock uh, their shelves, get more inventory, shipping increases. So the economy, economy looks flat. Okay. Let's jump to the answer. Well, so, I mean, uh, freight is... Can you a, expand on that for us? Well, freight is a, uh, a leading indicator because, as you were saying, uh, uh, stuff doesn't sell until till it already moved. So, um, so if stuff's not moving at an increasing rate, that means 
stuff not going to be selling at an increasing rate. So um, as everybody can expect, uh, imagine uh, you know, the economy in 2013 shouldn't be a disaster, but it shouldn't be anything great either. So, yeah. Sometimes people say flat is the new growth or something. I see. <laughs> so you guys are building a brand new building in Kansas City, Missouri, and it's uh, it's going to be a big building, 200,000 square feet. Talk to us about uh, that process because that's in my strategic plan for the next year. It is a 200,000 square foot building myself. Um, we have that in common. That's that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So talk to us about you know how you pick the location, why you pick the location, the design, just the whole process it, it takes to go through. Because just as a as a small business owner, there's a lot that goes into which building am I going to lease next, and you know what amenities yeah. do we want for our team? How do you go about actually building that big building? So the bigger story would be this will be our probably eighth or ninth building in Kansas City. So um, so we go through space like crazy, um, and. Uh, you know, for this Kansas City, Missouri move, basically I'm just a, a corporate sellout, you know, chasing tax incentives or whatever we're getting this. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and I always told these guys, I'm not even talking to the government because I don't like them anyway, but uh, so don't talk to me about incentives and all this other stuff. Then I heard the price tag, and I was like, our CFO was at this guy's office within an hour after the call. So, so we like it. <laughs> uh, but it is a, a corporate sellout, and I don't even buy some others to do it. But it really is space. We, uh, I like us being in one space. We're currently in two buildings. We were in two buildings around 06. Um, so when you run out of space, you get a second building or more, and then uh, our preference is to be in one building. So um, I think that's about as big as you can get. I know maybe there's bigger buildings, but not this town really. So. Right, right. So uh, yeah. As far as um, entrepreneurship in Kansas City goes, uh, there's <clears throat> At least I've observed a heightened sense of awareness of wanting to extend and expand the startup community and just entrepreneurial education in Kansas City um, with the Big Five initiative in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, obviously, a lot of initiatives through different organizations in, in Kansas City and ju just a growth startup community in general. What, in, in your opinion, um, in order for Kansas City to continue to move forward towards that goal, what does Kansas City need? Um, is issues that I've heard. Broached or stuff like funding, uh, either more um, awareness of funding needs or funding that's available in Kansas City, or we actually need more here. Um, that's just an example. But what would you say Kansas City needs in order to get just increased further entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, so the last thing you need is a chamber of commerce telling you how to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, can you give me your honest opinion? <laughs> I don't feel like you've been really candid with us That's at all. That's the way to get entrepreneurs started. Is have the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I don't think we have a point that uh, uh, group yet, but I uh, suppose we've moved to all Kansas City. Aside. Yeah. Suppose that we're being forced to join it to, to get that as a tax incentive. So, uh, so um, if someone were to go go to your office or ask you in a setting like this, what does Kansas City mean? Yeah. yeah. So uh, look, I think uh, I think like places like Criminal Law. Not kidding, but. Uh, 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 so, um, you know, I've done some other uh, startups, mentored some uh, startups. Uh, you know, not everybody should go hire their own programmers. Not everybody should like, be their own programmers. But, um, but like when I was starting Freco, um, you know, I didn't want to just go hire all developers. Uh, I wanted to use a mix of in-house developers and, and external. Um, and you know, you get scared. It's like big place with big overhead. So it's like. Um, but so you want it cheap, but you don't want it to be uh, like offshore and you're trying to figure out how to deal with people in India or something. So, um, so I'd say, you know, development's real uh, big hurdle because <coughs> most, most startups, even if they're in like materials or something, it's going to involve some form of technology. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, you know, learning, getting expertise from people who've already done it, that's helpful. So, mentoring. Uh, and then development, I think, is key because um, you know, everything technology-wise has to get developed somehow, and um, you know, most people can't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. you, you brought up hiring, um, you know, employees versus contractors, and that's a, that's a great topic. I was talking to someone earlier tonight. Is how do you know when to uh, pull?
pull that trigger. Um, if you're, if you're, you have the money to pay for it. Right. <laughs> expand, <laughs> expand on that just, just a little bit. I heard like, what strategies did you take to? How do you switch from a strategy of we're going to have a mix of developers and contractors to more? Well, let's bring some more employees on. Is it is it a cultural thing? Do you want to bring more people into your culture? Um, how, how does that work? You know, I, I'd say you want expertise. You want um, you want speed and um, and quality. So. And you know everything costs money. So uh, you know I'm a big fan of the uh, Jason Fried book Rework, and um, that that book talks about uh, raising outside money as Plan Z. Um, so preferably you don't you don't raise any outside money. So okay, great. Now how are you going to get any development done? Uh, these days there's so many online tools that are that are free, so you can or nearly free, so you can just mash them together if you got some. Uh, that's really cool because you know back in my old times uh, you could do that. Right. But based on the the Kansas City economy and just the resources available, what kind of startups do you think would do well in Kansas City from an industry perspective? Um, you know I don't think any industry is that uh, necessary, but uh, like industry focus is is requisite based on. I mean Kansas City is like not a small city, so. Uh, you could get spin outs uh, in healthcare because of Cerner. Uh, you can get spin outs in freight because of Yellow Freight, Freight Corps, things like that. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's ideas that drive startups, not really industries, I think. So, like, Freight Corps wasn't really designed to be like all about freight, it was more about, okay, where can we apply, where can I apply internet technology to it if we chose freight? <coughs> As, as an entrepreneur, what have you found to be the most important characteristics uh, to succeed as an entrepreneur? Obviously, it's not guaranteed, but what traits help to have in order to get you there? Yeah, I mean, you guys know as entrepreneurs generally, um, you got to be like really, uh, you got to have like no fear of failure. Uh, you have to have this blind passion that it's going to work. Um, and it really, I think most Decent ideas, if you gave enough time and money, would work. Uh, but people generally uh, run out of you know, money or time, uh, and they don't succeed. But it's not because uh, the idea it wasn't good. I mean, people would talk you out of it by the time you know you got too far if your idea sucked. But um, but you know you got to go through pivots and iterations because you're never going to get it just right the first time. And you know, good thing is entrepreneurs are. are Self-selecting, they're not like going to be forced to try it. So, um, so usually they're not going to be that uh, quick to fold. So, so it sounds like drive, endurance, the ability to persevere through those times of, oh, we're not going to make it. It's usually at that point where some people decide, well, I'm just going to, you know, close up shop. But what you're saying is, as, as entrepreneurs, when, once you get to that point, even if, because I've heard some people say, um, don't let money stop you. From you know taking your idea forward, if you need money, that there are available resources out there. But it's really about taking your idea and keep moving past those those tough times. Yeah, I mean every every successful company had a lot of hurdles to get there. So um, and you know uh, it also takes some money. So it, I, I like Jason for you when he says um, you don't need money because uh, customers should pay you money right out of the gate, but Okay, um, how do you get the customer before you know, if you had more money? So it is a bit of a chicken or the egg. And th there's a lot of guys in Kansas City that are entrepreneurs that are, uh, let's say, not young anymore, uh, that uh, that are involved in startups. And mm -hmm. uh, and I, I talk to guys all the time. They're like, Hey, you got any startups I can invest in? I'm like, uh, uh, No, no, nothing. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so the money's in town. You just have to. Tap into the right people, and once you tap in, that's pretty much everybody knows each other. Right. You just said that every successful company or CEO has had their, their series of hurdles. What would you say your biggest hurdles at every quote were? Ours was the exception. We had them. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We had plenty. Um, uh, we had look. Our our carrier suppliers uh, didn't know what the internet was because they weren't that bright, uh, and so. They start saying, oh, you're an internet company. Well, we can't give you contract pricing because you'll put it out there on that internet. So, 
Uh, so we're like, for a while, you know, we were like, we're not an internet company, we're just, you know, a sales company. So, um, so you know, you had guys freaking out for no reason. Um, I had a lot of HR issues. I hired a, I, I was, when I was uh, just starting out, I had this guy from Yellow Freight, he was like in his 50s, uh, say, oh, I'm gonna leave Yellow Freight and come work for you, and I'm really smart, and I was like, wow, you must know a lot about freight, so sure, and um, the guy was a complete idiot, and, um, and you know, wasted like months of our time with this you know, being an idiot, so, uh, so <laughs> hiring bad people can really cost you stuff, especially what they call articulating competence, so uh, I'm, I'm serious, they're out there, these are guys that talk like they know everything, and you're because they're so articulate that, yep, they know everything except for the problem they don't. And, and then you're like, shit, that guy's one of those guys. So, <laughs> so HR issues can be a big hurdle. Had them. Um, it reminds me of you know Jim Collins' book, getting people, the right people along the us, and then getting them in the right seat. Of, of your, uh, you know, of your, of your position now at Rayquil, how much time uh, do you spend personally uh, recruiting, whether it's your management team or whatnot? of trying to get those right people on the bus? And is it something that a CEO um, or an owner of a company should spend the majority of their time on? Yeah, I mean, what I do right now is not that applicable because, you know, most people aren't going to be you know, dealing with that many people. But, um, but I've always been very involved in, in, in recruiting, especially at the you know, management executive levels. Uh, it goes back to the culture. It's like if you want to let somebody else recruit people, then, then might as well let them pick the culture and do it. Um, so, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're looking for the people that will fit your, your vision of culture and things like that. Uh, that's not something you want to pass on to somebody else. So, um, and even then you don't get it right, you don't have the time, but at least you try. Right, right. So what does, uh, what does success mean to Tim Barton? What are your personal metrics for success? Um, well, I like disruptive stuff, so we haven't been disruptive enough for a couple of years, so, um, so we've got some new disruptive stuff coming. Uh, so to me, uh, you know, the core business is cool and it's got, you know, expected growth metrics and things like that, but, um, but changing industry, uh, our industry, changing things, the way people are doing it, that's what motivates me. So success is, you know, can we disrupt, can we change? Um, and that, that's applicable for any startup, any entrepreneur. It's like, it, like um, I think it's uh, I think it's Clay Christensen's books talks about sustaining innovation versus disruptive innovation. So, um, so if you're just going to make a, a product that's you know a little bit cheaper than the other guy's product or uh, an app that's a little bit like this other app, then then those are sustaining innovations. Or like, oh, mine's a little better. And that's not that's not that big a deal. I mean, it's like the next guy is going to have one that's better than yours, and then you're going to like say, well, I thought mine was good yesterday, and now someone else is better. So disruptive innovation is is really what what people should drive to. It's it's it it changes the landscape so that it's not easily copied, mm -hmm. and um, it pisses people off because like shit, he did that. That changed our business. So. So I think entrepreneurs uh, should be focused, as as Clayton Christensen says, should focus on disruption because that's that's where you really you know get a big jump on everybody else. What, what's the best way to measure that? You said that you feel like Franco it's not being disruptive enough. How do how do you know that? Is it intuition or do you have? Mm -hmm. how, well, how we got a lot of copycats uh, the last couple of years and, and a lot of competition. We got. It's, it, we created uh, what's kind of an industry, and there's peers and things like that. So, um, and so you got to disrupt the whole landscape if you want to be different and, and and really, you know, get a lot of growth. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're only going to get incremental growth. And you know, in, in sustaining in sustaining innovation, it's like uh, uh, like cat and mouse. Like I'm a little better than him, so I, I'm doing well. Now I'm a little better. He's a little better than me, so he's doing better. And just fight back and forth and. Disruptive innovation, it's like, that's all yesterday, it's all this tomorrow. You know? mm -hmm. So it's like my kids who are teenagers uh, bailed on Facebook you know, a year ago or so and just totally went Twitter and they hate Facebook, whatever they say they do when they're on Facebook every the time. Uh, but, you know, that t Twitter, you could say, disrupts Facebook. So right. um, stuff that we move to a new, new whole platform, a whole new thing is disruptive. 
knowing what you what you know now and all, all the books and, and the research and just different opinions that have come out about startups and like you said disruptive innovation if you get if you had it uh, the chance to go back and do it over again back in 1998, knowing what you know now, what, what, is there anything that you do differently? Oh boy, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we got a lot right. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's stuff I do differently yesterday, so forget. <laughs> can't remember that far back, but yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff you do differently every every period, every turn, but as long as you make mostly correct turns and the, the bad turns don't kill you off the cliff. Mm -hmm. uh, That's always good. Yeah. So where's where's Tim Barton 10 years from now and what, what is he doing? Tim Barton's getting old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I do a lot in education reform because uh, education is pretty crappy, especially in Kansas City. Um, and uh, so I might, I might do stuff in that, like nonprofit stuff. Nonprofits can be really aggravating because, you know, uh, you know that. <laughs> 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 I wrote with Daniel at the, uh, uh, what's it called? Sports <laughs> Commission. Uh, nonprofits can get really aggravating because they're not commercially minded oftentimes. And you know, I'm commercially minded in a nonprofit. But, uh, but you know, uh, I, I probably do some stuff in nonprofits, uh, or I think actually I, I have one business model to disrupt the postal service legally, not legally, not violence. But like, like who doesn't hate mail? Like, uh, like so a little question. Uh, you know, you have like Lockline, uh, Life LifeLock, or whatever. Like, the thing that keeps you from getting your identity stolen or something, it's like 150 bucks a year or whatever. But how much would you pay to have no mail in your mailbox? Like, anybody pay 200 bucks a year to get rid of all your mail? You got one, two? You guys don't want to pay to get rid of your mail? I'll throw my hand away. How are you doing with all that mail? Like, my mailbox is filled with just pure shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I would easily pay 20 bucks a month. Just, I want the mailbox gone and just put a flower there. So, <laughs> so I've got some ideas. You've got some ideas. You, you mentioned, but I don't have enough to the customers, so uh, <laughs> I have to give it away. You mentioned education, and obviously that's a hot topic in Kansas City right now. When you say education reform, are you talking K through 12 or all the way up through the university? And, and what does that what does that look like? What specifically are you wanting to change? Uh, that's a big, long answer for that one, but uh, it's generally K through 12. Um, so uh, one flavor of, of education reform is, is charter schools. People think of those as um, fancy private schools or something, but, uh, but those are public schools. Uh, in, in Missouri, charter schools, which are public schools, get funded uh, at about $8,000 per student, in case of about twelve, five, dollars 13000 per student. So public school A gets 8000 public school B gets 13000 um, It's just because one is represented by unions and school districts and things. So, um, so there's a lot of inequity and, uh, and unfairness. Like if you if you go to school in KCMO, I think it's unaccredited now. So uh, you're not gonna have a good life experience probably if you don't get educated. So it's just a very shameful situation. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way because like like one argument I had with this uh, pretty famous education guy was was like, oh, it's the unions, and and he's like, that's not the unions, and I'm like. He's like, um, and anyway, he, he convinced me like in 30 seconds, it's not the union. So uh, the example I use is in Kansas City, uh, KCMO, Union School District, uh, suck. Um, Johnson County, Kansas, you got Blue Valley School District, Shona Mission, really good school districts, uh, union schools. So um, clearly with that example right there, it's not solely the union. So, right. um, so anyway, the answer actually, if anybody wants to know, is the, the school boards. So uh, if the school board sucks, you'll have a bad experience of school board. It's right. my thesis. And, and you have three daughters. And so okay, two daughters, two daughters. one son. Okay. And so obviously, and, and they're in, all in high school? They are uh, juniors in high school. You guys do the math. They're all juniors. 
And so obviously, obviously, has that as being a dad made an impact on obviously what you want to do as far as being involved in education and wanting to change it? Yeah, you know, uh, kids like when they were in second or third grade, uh, this the, the two grades and two teachers in that grade, and this one teacher sucked. Nobody wanted their kids to get into that class. And uh, so I talked to the principal. I'm like, if everyone thinks this teacher sucks, why don't you get rid of this teacher? He's like, I can't, the union sends me the teachers, you know, so you can't even fire the teacher. And, it, and now I know a lot about education reform. Uh, in the U.S., it costs something like five hundred thousand dollars to get rid of a teacher. So. So you can't get rid of bad teachers. Uh, when independent school district uh, uh, reassumed those uh, those couple of schools a couple of years ago, um, the uh, guy Jim Hinson, who's the, the superintendent there, was able to um, to redo all the teacher agreements because it went from one union like NEA to NFTA, which was his union or something. So because he assumed them, they had to transfer unions, so he got to re-interview everybody. So out of like. Uh, I think it was 500 teachers he interviewed, they, they rehired two. So, uh, that's <laughs> legit. Like, it's that. So. Anyway, we digress. No, this is all part of going through the grind. Last question, then I'm gonna, then the next part, we're, I'm going to open up to you know around 15 minutes, 15 to 28. We can go longer of, of Q&A. So if you have any questions for Tim, uh, please feel free to, to shout them out. But um, obviously, we're at Startup Grind. So how much longer? Do you plan to, to grind it out uh, at Free Flow? How much time do you, how much time? Depends on the day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some days, uh, maybe one more day. Um, you know, it depends. We've got this new uh, disruptive product coming out in um, March. Uh, and if that works, uh, it puts a lot of gas, a lot of fuel in my tank. Uh, if it fails, I probably won't be out of gas, but, um, but you know, like, uh, it's just, it's got to be something new or interesting, otherwise it'll run out of gas. So, so we still get some other other chances to uh, be successful, so uh, I'm just sticking with it for now. Great. Question? On the subject of failure, what was your biggest failure? And what do you mean? Biggest by, <laughs> biggest by what measure? <laughs> Shameful failure. <laughs> 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 uh, well, I'll tell you the um, something germane probably for people. So, um, so when I was starting my uh, telecom business with some college buddies, this friend from grad school was like, "Hey, this other guy from Arthur Anderson and I want to start this business. You want to join in with us?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, of course." So now I got two startups going, and you know, mostly spending my time at the telecom one, but also spending a lot of time at the other one. And finally, we shut down the other one. Uh, and the lesson I found from that was, um, like, do one thing and do it well. Like, if you think you can dabble in two, three startups, probably it's probably okay for a little while just to see, okay, which one really sounds most interesting. But you can't do that sustainably and. Um, and so I would say that's that my big lesson. It wasn't a huge failure, but it was a huge lesson of like, if you're not, if that's not your passion, that's what you're doing all the time, then you probably shouldn't do it. Hmm. Tim, in the early days, uh, Frank quote, did you get into issues where you had to offer equity in exchange for paying somebody in the early days? Um, I don't think they would take equity back then. They didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we didn't do that. I, I think people that do that today, it's not a bad idea if you if you don't want to like raise outside money. I, I, I'd be careful about the agreements and things like that. So, to, I mean, it's, it'd be a terrible shame to have uh, like Zuckerberg did, you know, have the, the company get successful and get all this legacy of people that were just given cheap stock and things like that. So, um, it might be easier just to like put the stock in one place, get money, give people cash because people know what cash is worth. Generally. Do you want your kids to be entrepreneurs? And if so, what do you do to help mentor them? Uh, so my son says he would like to be an entrepreneur. Um, I'm a, uh, I guess a, uh, a student of Myers Briggs personality stuff, and um, I think his personality type can work as an entrepreneur. But I, I would look at at, at Myers Briggs personalities to determine, okay, is this person cut out to be an entrepreneur? Um, he's got, uh, his personality type is the same as Danny O'Neill's. Uh, so uh, Danny's a good entrepreneur.
entrepreneur, but he's a different type of entrepreneur. He's very socially uh, minded, very uh, very idealistic, uh, and so that's good to know because then he can say, okay, well, you should if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you should be one that's like focused on not maximizing, like taking over the world, but maybe being more idealistic. So, um, so I'd say uh, it comes down to whether people's personalities fit certain things. Uh, so with technology becoming like really big here with startups and even the normal business practices here in Kansas City, what can the universities and colleges do to make sure that they're creating the student that can be hired immediately out to be successful in these businesses? It's a good question. I think universities are so detached from reality that it's probably a, a hard thing to do. I mean, if most professors uh, haven't been in the real world in 20 years, what are they going to do? I mean, it's like, um, you know, our, our, put it this way, like our company is like 14 years old, our, our technology is all .NET, and you know, if you got like modern day guys using Rails and, and Node and things like that, it's like, I'm not even qualified to talk about technology, so you guys might want to get me out of here soon. <laughs> like, how's a professor who's not been in business for 40 years supposed to teach anything of any value? So, unless they have like guest professors or something like that, I would say, you know, maybe have send them to start a grind or something, but I wouldn't try to teach it too much with the people they do. So, do you think that there's still value in a college education for people who do degrees in technology? Probably for parents to feel good about it. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, it's like, really, what do they, I mean, you can learn programming uh, languages and things like that. If, if you take a, like a real, like, almost like a Votech approach to college, then you could probably learn stuff. If you're doing like uh, general stuff, you're just sending, you're paying a bunch of money to send kids to the party. So um, I think there's got to be a better way, but, but I'm not advising people. Do you want your kids to go to college? Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't miss it. The, the miss it for the world, and it's not about learning. They they can't miss a social thing for their life. So I I don't think they have any intent. My son maybe, but my daughters don't have any intent of learning. <laughs> definitely go. <laughs> so I guess to follow up to follow up with that question, um, is there a particular university or college here that you would? like to see maybe turn more into like a Caltech, Berkeley, MIT style of college? Uh, well, you know, UMKC is like on the um, on that list of uh, top entrepreneur programs. Uh, I don't know a ton about it, but at least it's on that list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it says figured, something, right? I figure somebody's looking at something before they put them on the list. So, um, so, I mean, that's a good thing, right? So, uh, I, and I'm an advisor at the KU Business School. Uh, I've got the, the dean of the KU Business School on my board, um, and she gets it. I mean, she wants to change the school. She knows that, like, I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but I think she knows that they're like mass producing stuff for 20 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. So you're a tech startup. Uh, what role did sales and marketing play in growing your business from the beginning, and, and what role did you play? Yeah, so uh, I actually tell people that you know our business is really uh, a technology and sales company. So all the other stuff, maybe we're not as great at it or whatever. But um, so I always very was always very sales focused, and um, and and the first people I hired were, were technology people and sales people. So uh, today we have something like uh, 600 sales people, um, and uh, so. Uh, maybe not as much in marketing, but uh, but uh, a lot in just sales because I, I don't know how long that kind of stuff lasts because who wants a sales call? Um, but so far it's still out there. But you know, viral stuff, social stuff, a lot better angles than selling because you can't really direct sell to like people in their homes. You can't. I don't even know why business people. Like they, they banned telemarketing years ago in homes, but you can still telemarket into businesses, so that's good for us. But it's like, when is that going to stop? Because you know, who wants a sales call every five minutes? Right. But not on it's still cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will confess, I'm not an entrepreneur myself, but I have worked for entrepreneurs along my way. Um, what are some of the key qualities you look for in employees? You were talking about HR being a big thing. What are kind of the, I don't know, top two or top three qualities that 
someone that you, if you're interviewing someone that you look for? Yeah, so I interview executives, and um, really they have to have uh, uh, just a real high risk tolerance. So um, we used to do like um, personality profiling, and uh, so on this on this uh, component, which was risk, uh, like uh, risk seeking versus uh, risk aversion. Uh, like the four C level people were like top one percentile, two percentile, three percentile, four percent. It was literally like you know 99th, 90th. So anyway, we're all like making fun of the guy with 96 percent. Scared of shadow. So I'd say risk tolerance because if you're going to be like dynamic and changing and doing things like that, if you're like not willing to like risk everything all the time, then you probably should go back to the post office and uh, wait for something to come and disrupt it. How's technology changing your business? How do you think it's going to change your business in the days to come? Uh, you know, the problem is it hasn't changed enough. So uh, I, I, I don't know if I can actually remember. What do you think we were on before .NET? What were they just prior to that? Yeah. No. Like C sharp. Like C sharp. Yeah. So we went, like, you know, we evolved like a, like a glacier in technology for big companies. So, it, you know, we're all stuck in .NET. We can't get out of it. Uh, just like um, businesses before us are stuck in whatever platform they used to be in. You know, where those guys get new COBOL programmers from. You know, it's <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, we turned to criminal apps to talk to them about, like, you know, rails and things like that. Our guys can't really, we can't rely on them to, to do, you know, current languages for uh, development. But, but the good thing about, like, even for an established business like ours or any startup, uh, you know, you can build businesses today with like all open APIs, and then it doesn't matter what language it is, as long as it's open, you can just connect it, connect that to customers, suppliers, uh, enterprises, things like that. So, uh, so I think that's a really good thing, and that means you don't have to be stuck in things like .NET. So the the stuff we're developing for the future will be all like maybe Rails, and um, and just using it as like a like an open platform for us to pull in and pull out, pull stuff out of. And, uh, not worrying about can we put it on our stack of like derelict pages and stuff. Which I use that kind of terminology in front of our CIO and he's just like <laughs> <laughs> Is it the size of your company that prevents you from is it all or nothing? If you want to shift to a new language, is it that the whole company needs to shift or can you do it? Like we got like I don't know, a bazillion lines of code and ancient stuff. I mean our our rating engine is just, you know, fourteen years old and because every every new rule, oh, let's add that on top. Let's add, let's add that on top, and it's like you, know, you just end up with all this stuff. So you can't, you can't have, you're, you're literally just waiting to become the post office or sprint joke of some guy in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so with the first the first company was with uh, a group called Buddies, right? So partnership with several of you, and then was Freight Quote that was so that was. Yeah, it's your sole partnership. So, what's your position on partnerships versus going out solo and any advice? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, a lot of times guys, will, people will come up and say, oh yeah, so we're gonna start this company, me and my uh, my buddy here, and okay, so we're both programmers, we're both accountants, we're both whatever. They're always like, anytime that happens, they're both like the same people showing up at the same place and we're gonna be partners. And I'm always like, there's no diversity from that. What if one guy was good at sales and the other guy was good at development? That's something, you know. No, we're both exactly the same. Genius. So, uh, <laughs> so I would say like, and also uh, most times people use like buddies. Uh, I think it's like a crutch. Like uh, I know it was for me in my first business. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do was fail and then have to go get a job and tell them it was a failure and all this other stuff. So if you failed with some buddies, then you know, it's their fault. <laughs> uh, but if you did it yourself, then you know you can hire people or you know, get expertise without like you know getting it from your buddy who had to typically have the same expertise you have anyway. Um, so I'm I'm not obviously a big fan of, of having partners unless uh, you don't have capital, which is typically the case, and your partner was like you know the polar opposite. So and you know in 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 
like books will tell you, you know, a, a successful business at any size has to have like an inside focused person and an outside focused person, like Daniel George. Uh, and that's good to have a partner that way because then you're saying, look, I want to focus on this and you're going to focus on that. So that'd be really good. But those, those would probably be uh, e more easy to get wrong. Than On the subject of culture, um, you kind of talked about it already, but how much effect, how would you describe great books culture, and how much effect do you think you as a person and your personality affects that culture, and then also do you have any specific motivating factors that you instill in your employees? So I think the cult, I, I, I'm pretty sure I influence the culture. I mean, this is how I dress for work, so uh, um, maybe I'll dress how I need or they think I dress stupidly, but uh, the culture is like, uh, intentionally driven for me. I think it's it's a real culture. I don't think they're just telling me, hey, we got a shirt it's that way. But, uh, so it's it's people that that are, are open to change. Uh, it's people that work uh, self-directedly. So uh, we don't like to have people where you know if you're not staring at them, then they're you know doing something else. It's like uh, people are supposed to show up, do their stuff, uh, and then we promote work-life balance. So we say. You know, five o'clock, everybody clears out. So, um, so a lot of places like Cerner would say, like, why is the parking lot remotely not full at seven p.m.? Did they write an email? Uh, but, um, but we're definitely the opposite. It's like, look, uh, don't need to work. You're not allowed to work past five. But uh, for those hours you're there, you expect to be fully engaged and not being set. So, um, so that creates a positive selection of people that like that. And people who don't fit into that. Uh, hopefully, generally, kind of get pushed away. Kind of on the same culture uh, question or topic, uh, you hear about companies like Twitter or Facebook where they have these ball tables going 24 hours a day and they call. Have you felt the need to change your uh, work environment to compete with other similar tech companies to, to, to retain the hire? Yeah, back in our day, we had a foosball table and an air hockey table and all that stuff, but ultimately that was really kind of silly because it's like, um, those are good uh, kind of um, icons if your culture is, hey, you know what, we're going to work here pretty much until midnight every night, and, um, and then we'll be back at 7 a.m. tomorrow. So if that's what you're doing, then you should probably have a foosball table and couches and things like that. Uh, but if you're saying, look, you got to work all day and then leave, end of the day, uh, then you actually don't need to like uh, accommodate them with toys and games and snacks and things like that. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, it's important I think if you're grinding people. So um, and actually startups should probably grind and, and work a lot of hours and they should have stuff to kind of blow off steam and, and, and interact, you know, have fun and then get back to their stuff. So so I'm not saying that's bad, I'm just saying if you kind of become established and it's time to work then all of a sudden, you, you, you ruin the culture. We would ruin the culture we have because the people we want actually work self-directedly, and then they leave, and then you have this foosball table to accommodate the people who don't fit that. Like, <laughs> I want to show up and play, and then I want to leave. So, uh, so they would. Tim, you uh, started great uh, You were self-funded from the funds you had from your telecom company. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Uh, if you had to do that all over again without the benefit of those funds, uh, if you had to bootstrap or if you had to go to the well, uh, go to venture capitalist, uh, could you have done that or would you have done that? Um, yeah, I had a, well, I mean, I guess it's a um, redundant because, you know, in my telecom business, I, I helped a lot of people uh, get their their investment in their businesses. I bought a bunch of companies and then we merged together and we sold it. So um, so I, I, I saved a bunch of companies from dying before they all went out of business. So I could have gone to those guys and asked them for money, but then I also had some money too. So uh, if they didn't have money, if I didn't have money, they probably wouldn't have money either. So I don't know what to go to. So, you know, fast forward to today, uh, you know, there's, there's angels out there and there's, um, you know, there's definitely not VCs, I don't think, around unless you, you know, already were fully established and then you know, they'll, they'll find you. But um, So, you know, I think raising capital is good if, if you, you know, if you have to have it. 
if you could get by without raising capital, I think that's a pretty good idea too. So, uh, and you can do a hybrid too. The guys I'm mentoring uh, are kind of a hybrid where they're they're going to be raising some money, but they don't need a lot, and they're really primarily raising the money uh, to bring in mentors. So they're going to have a very limited group of mentors, and they're going to um, require them to invest to make sure they're actually interested in. But but really just to get. Uh, On your calendars, uh, that's our next. The location is still to be determined, but Herb C of Think Big Partners is going to be our presenter. So uh, that'll be on our meetup page. But yeah, February 21st. Thanks.